failure is man's inability to reach his goals in life, whatever they may be. O.G. Mandino Selling Basic Human Behavior After listening to the material in this video, you should understand that selling or persuasion is a basic skill underlying not only successful living, but success in all aspects of business. Realize that salespeople perform tasks that are needed in our society. They do useful things in facilitating business affairs. Be free of the mythology about selling that most people believe. In this section, we will look at the profile of a corporate president who does a lot of selling. Just about everything I've been able to accomplish, I owe to my IBM training. I worked for IBM for four years after I graduated from the University of Colorado in 1963. I learned the computer business there. Then I saw an opportunity in the computer industry and started my own company. I sold it a few years ago to start my present business of selling power filtering and distribution units to computer users. I do a lot of top level selling and I feel that it is directly responsible for much of my success. Top level selling, Bill says, can be very effective or very detrimental to your organization. The fact that the president of the company is involved establishes the seriousness of the company in wanting to establish a relationship. And, if the president of the selling company is talking to the president or high-level management of the buying company, then the middle or lower levels of management often react much more positively and quickly. If the president of the selling company is not successful in establishing a good relationship, then normally everything backfires. All right, I get it. You're a salesperson already. You've been selling since the day you was born. Remember when you wheedled that bicycle from your parents? Salesmanship. How about that time you talked the teacher into giving you a higher grade? Salesmanship. You sell something several times a day. The question is whether you are good at it or not, because of your success in business and in life depends largely on your ability to sell yourself, your firm, your services, your ideas, and your products to others. The American Marketing Association defines selling as the personal or impersonal process of assisting and or persuading a prospective customer to buy a commodity or a service or to act favorably upon an idea that has commercial significance to the seller. But selling really has a far broader scope. We prefer to define selling as the art of persuading another person to do something when you do not have or do not care to exert the direct power to force the person into doing it. Selling is persuasion. Everyone does it. If you own a small business, you would be continually trying to persuade other people to do what you want them to do. Lend you money, buy from you, sell to you, work for you properly, pay you promptly, or grant you whatever government positions you might seek. Persuasion is the fabric of daily business ops. Moreover, you use persuasion all the time in daily living. 
whether you're on the job, at school, at home, or even when you are shopping, you are continually trying to get other people to do what you want them to do. Leadership requires persuasion. The ability to handle people is the foundation of leadership. Men and women in managerial positions, in government, education, labor, the armed services, medicine, and business are constantly confronted with the need to get along with others and to handle people. And here's the point. This ability to handle people is little more than salesmanship under another name. Great leaders are great salespeople. It is this universal application of the principles of selling which justifies its steady by those who never expect to be professional salespeople. You probably aspire to leadership in some area. You can achieve it by mastering the art of handling people, selling ideas to them. A leader is a leader only if there are followers, and the main task is to persuade the followers by one means or another to strive to do what the leader wants done. So, you may ask, what are the uses of selling? Why should I steady salesmanship? I'm never going into sales. Perhaps not. But who knows? Millions of people have been unexpectedly thrust into jobs demanding the ability to sell. Even though a person may not engage directly in any kind of selling work, the hard fact still exists that one can find virtually no occupation or profession that does not demand selling skills. Many talented physicians, architects, engineers, scientists, musicians, dope men, and lawyers have not advanced professionally because they have failed to recognize the selling aspects of their work. The brilliant electronic engineer, a woman who recognized the selling aspects of her work, developed numerous valuable patents for her employer, not only was unable to advance into management, but eventually fired. After hours of venting her frustrations to a confidant, she concluded, I've never been able to sell myself or my ideas to other people. To learn what errors people starting their first job should be warned about, a group of vocational teachers wrote several thousand employers asking them to look up the last three persons fired and tell why they had been let go. The teachers had expected a long catalog of reasons. They were amazed that more than two-thirds of the people who lost their jobs were fired for one reason. And it was the same in every sort of business for workers of all ages and sexes. They simply couldn't get along with other people. Frequently, someone who has no intention of going into sales enters some other department of a business only to discover that some sales work is expected. Every employee is a salesperson. The slogan of a great number of businesses, and it works wonders. The modern marketing concept now embodied in the management philosophies of most leading corporations claims that all business is selling. The Irving Trust Company, one of New York's leading commercial banks, staged a drive for new accounts that in 10 weeks gained 11,673 new customers. The selling job was handled by bank employees from every department. The graduate school of bank marketing at Louisiana State University provides its students with several courses in salesmanship and sales training, during which considerable attention is devoted 
to how bank management can provide all its people with selling skills. Many people begin their careers in some non-selling job only to discover sales may be their forte. Little did James Roach, former president of General Motors, dream in 1927 when he worked for GM as a statistician and he rose through the sales department to become the sales manager of Cadillac and 10 years later was placed in charge of all aspects of GM marketing. Two engineers employed by Beach Aircraft approached the author with a problem for which they found themselves unprepared. How can we persuade our top management to expand our efforts in manufacturing cryogenic hardware? They continued, we are convinced that the market for cryogenic hardware will grow rapidly during the next decade. If we don't expand our facilities now in advance of the market's need, we will be left behind by the competitors. Presently, oceanography is the prime market we would like to develop, but how can we persuade our top management to make the necessary financial commitments to go after this market? That is the problem of salesmanship. Alcee Grimes thought she accepted the job with Carnation Company as a project manager trainee. She graduated with her MBA degree in management. However, they told her that she first needed to learn to sell and sent her to Phoenix, Arizona for six months of sales training. The electrical engineer who is working full-time for a small electronics company while studying for his master's degree was dismayed when given the full responsibility project managership for a small line of analytical instruments that the company made for analytical chemistry teachers. On returning from a short trip during which he visited several colleges in the hope of selling some sets, he confessed, I couldn't sell a single one. I just know what they said to do. It was awful. This same firm had to dismiss a purchasing agent who lacked sales skills. That's right, even purchasing agents must sell. Prompt deliveries of critical items are crucial to a project's profitability. This person had been so alienated, suppliers thought that it was impossible to persuade them to do any favors when the need arose. Top Management and selling. It would be difficult to find a chief executive who has not spent some time in the sales field and who does not even know now how to spend a good portion of the time daily selling something. Indeed, in this age of large-scale manufacturers selling to equally large mass distributors, the importance of top-level selling has increased greatly. As firms grow larger and larger by buying, it becomes more centralized. The individual transaction has become much larger. Thus, it has become far more important to the seller. The decision makers for large buyers are often inaccessible to any other than top level execs of the company trying to sell. Industrial buyers have a tendency to marry suppliers of regularly purchased commodities. Such sales contacts are usually made at high levels. All of which simply means that many situations a firm may experience. Effective salespeople make top executives. And you're not apt to become one without selling. The entrepreneur even sells. If you plan on running your own business, be assured that your success rests heavily on your selling skills. In the biography of Charles Revson, the founder of Revlon, 
It was made quite clear that the Enterprise succeeded because of Mr. Revson's most adept skills at selling his new concepts in nail enamel to beauty salons in New York. As they say, Mr. Charles was always selling. The entrepreneurship program at the University of Southern California provides its majors with a thorough preparation and persuasion skills because the 21 members of its advisory board unanimously urged that such training was critical to each of their successes. Advisor Bill Leonard's as we learned in the profile at the beginning of this chapter, began his career selling for IBM. His success selling computers proved the basis for his later successes as an entrepreneur. Salespeople. What is the role of salesperson in modern society? Competition is keen. We must recognize that most business concerns are in competition. A competition that is often fierce, with many firms striving to sell a similar product to the same buyers for essentially the same price. It is the persistence of this competition which makes selling necessary. An economic society in which much of the business is done in a free market is marvelously complex network of individuals and institutions whose relationships with each other are maintained in such a way that the system functions as desired with a minimum of friction. Each cog in the wheel we call society performs definite and necessary functions. When certain cogs no longer do things that society values, like Mark Zuckerberg, for example, they get discarded. Witness the near demise of rail travel in favor of driving or flying, and the advent of synthetic fibers and the fading away of natural ones. Salespeople are an economic institution in our society. Selling is a service that society has found must be done. Society can be both ruthless and benevolent. Ruthless in eliminating unwanted firms, activities, or people, such as Jeff Bezos, and benevolent in rewarding those who give it what it wants. Thus, salespeople must be performing functions which society values or they will be eliminated. However, the duties of a salesperson are forever changing and some commentators on modern marketing suggest that unless they change with the times, they may find themselves unessential. What factors are operating to bring about this change? First, there is the massive advertising of manufacturers' brands, which establish a preference for these brands among millions of consumers. When this is accomplished, the dealers are virtually forced to carry such brands, and little salesmanship is required to do so. But interesting, the world's largest advertiser, Procter & Gamble, one of the world's largest sale forces, says advertising does not eliminate salespeople. It simply makes the job easier and one of those competitors more difficult. Second, the gigantic retail organizations are buying more and more through committees instead of through departmental buyers. The manufacturer sales rep finds it difficult to get th going through these committees. The decisions of these committees are being governed more and more by the answers given by a computer, which has been fed data concerning sales to each of them. Profit margins, turnover, shelf space, etc. It is difficult to do much creative selling to an electronic computer. 
but the clever sales rep always finds his way to influence the situation. Third, in the largest chains, the buying decision may rest with the very top execs, and these people may prefer to deal with their counterparts in the manufacturer's organization rather than some sales rep. Even the purchasing agents of some big manufacturers may not possess final buying authority on important items. This authority may reside higher up, where it is hard for the salesperson to make contact, but there is still much sales work to be done at lower echelons. Despite the varying demands placed upon selling by the changing times, several definite functions will always remain to be performed. The salesperson must dispense innovation, possess knowledge, facilitate consumption, and act as a channel of communication with the market to service the trade. The Dispenser of Innovation In our society, we welcome the new rather than venerating and clinging to the old. Compared with the past, or with many other countries today, the rate of innovation in America is staggering. The Certified Grocers of California reviews 250 new products a week. Of these, an average of 57 will be accepted. 50 old ones will be dropped to make room. The life cycle of products is growing shorter. As fast as one new item reaches the market, two things to do the job better are coming out. But innovation is of little value to society until it is brought out of the lab and the warehouse. New products and services are of value only when knowledge of them is dispensed to those who can use them. So how can a shipping room survivor Keep up with all the new techniques and products that will go to handle goods more easily and cheaply. How can an accountant know about the latest innovations in data processing? How can a marketing manager know about the latest developments in packing materials? How can the electronic engineer keep abreast of the availability of the latest developments on certain components? How can a physician keep up with the latest drugs? The answer to all these questions is the same. The people cannot by themselves. Possibly keeping informed concerning all the innovations affecting their fields. One study of drug dealers and their sources of information concerning new drugs they find clearly provides the importance of the manufacturer's salespeople in the process. In reviewing several independent studies on new designer drugs, the dealer can use the internet to find drug distribution chains instead of relying on street-level salespeople. New information concerning drugs more than any other single source. Steady, the drug detailers are given a strong vote of confidence. The pharmaceutical reps calls on physicians to inform them of new developments and products. The busy MD depends on this representative to keep abreast of new pharmaceutical drugs their characteristics, and the side effects. The sales rep for packaging concerns call regularly upon the marketing managers and other executives connected with the packaging of products so that they consider the latest packaging ideas for use in their own businesses. Without selling, the process of introducing innovations would be greatly impeded because People have never the time or the inclination to continually seek out 
the newest developments. Emerson was removed from the realities of life when he said, Build a better mousetrap and the world will beat a path to your door. Without salespeople, the world would not know of your latest mousetrap, let alone the location of your door. Innovations, no matter how meritous, do not sell themselves. Eli Whitney could find no buyers for the cotton gin and was so impoverished at one time that he was compelled to borrow a suit of clothes to make a public speech. Jacquard, the French inventor of the loom, promised to revolutionize the production of lace. He was beaten and mobbed by the fellow townspeople because they thought he was robbing them of their opportunity to earn a living. Edison was compelled to install his incandescent lights in an office building free of charge to persuade anyone to give them a trial. Charles Newbold invented an iron plow in 1797, expecting that it would quickly supplant the clumsy and short-lived wooden plows then in use. The wooden plows only scratched the surface of the soil and were so dull that it required a small herd of oxen to pull one, whereas the new iron plow not only penetrated the ground, but more deeply could be pulled by only one team of ox. Newbold struggled for years to convince the farmers that the iron plow would not poison the soil and kill the seeds planted in it. It took King Gillette five years to sell his first seven safety razors. Few business executives would undertake to produce any new product if they did not have available means to sell it. Without aggressive selling, our economy would bog down, and the new improved products and services would not be brought forward for the betterment of our lives. No manufacturer would take a chance. No investors would risk the capital. No one would assist in such a hopeless venture. Therefore, Aggressive selling has been an important factor in making available a wider range of constantly improving products. The skeptics may claim that this innovation dispensing function of selling is greatly maligned. However, any executive who has spent frequent contact with salespeople should recall that they spend much of their time selling something new. <clears throat> we should also remember that even well-established products still require selling. Millions of new buyers enter the market each year. Buyers who have not heard the story. Every product is new and unfamiliar to many potential buyers. And even the old, familiar products are constantly being improved. And each improvement must be sold. Moreover, many products are brought so infrequently that even the persistent user may not have kept abreast with developments and is likely surprised to discover significant changes that have taken place since the last time they purchased a camera, typewriter, corn planter, lawnmower, office machine, phone, or computer. For the possessor, the possessor of knowledge, the salesperson can become an expert who knows more about the product and the problems than the next person. This knowledge function is so important that the other video will be devoted entirely to it. This product knowledge is only part 
of the story. The salesperson must also know about the products and how it will solve the customer's problem. IBM sales representatives may know the computer inside out, but how many sales would be made if the rep were unable to show the computer used in the customer's business? The catalytic agents in the consumption process Considerable friction exists in the marketplace, thus stifling consumption. The people want all sorts of goods and services, but many times the natural inertia keeps them from satisfying their desires. This slows down and disrupts the economy. If goods and services are not brought in sufficient volume, and today, that volume is extremely large. The people producing them lose their jobs. In 1980, many automobile workers learned the painful lesson of what happens when not enough product is sold. It's called the unemployment line. Consumption is necessary for employment. Selling lubricates and stimulates consumption by reducing inertia inherent in people. Not only do the persuasive powers of the salesperson attempt to overcome this inertia and encourage the people to buy their product, in many cases these powers make buying easier for the people. The Intelligence Agent one of the growing problems in our huge, complex society is that communications between the market and the maker. In the olden days, a shoemaker knew his market personally. His customers told him exactly what to make for him. Today, middlemen, advertising, retail clerks, etc., etc., have been inserted somewhere between uh, the shoe manufacturer and the shoe consumer. The basic problem still exists, communicating consumer desires back to the manufacturer. This essential function is performed largely by salespeople. One manufacturer of slacks for the collegiate market was caught napping one year when the styles changed. College men wanted a slack with a distinctly tapered look, but he was producing one with a full leg. The manufacturer detected the problem when retailers told the reps. The retailers had learned of it from the clerks, who were continually in contact with the ultimate consumer. Ideas should flow from field-level sales reps to sales management to engineering. Firms without sales representatives in the field may not know what is really going on in the market. One firm selling supplies to fertile wholesalers by direct mail was getting run out of the market by the competitor, which was giving an additional 10% of free goods deal under the table to key wholesale accountants who agreed to handle the products exclusively. The management knew its sales were dropping, but did not know why. Fortunately, a friend of the company eventually explained the competitor's practice, and the firm was able to counter the problem before he went bankrupt. However, the delay seriously injured the firm. A sales rep would have uncovered this practice quickly when calling upon a friendly wholesaler. So, what is the service function? Service function. The service function, selling jobs, does not end once the prospect is given an order, as will be examined in detail later. 
Any great salesperson knows that the work has only just begun when the order has been taken. And a salesperson may perform many services for a prospect before even making the first sale. As is stressed throughout the book, people did not buy products, but rather they buy benefits. If they did not get them, they will stop dealing with the source. A corrugated box sales rep found early in her career that customers weren't buying boxes and they weren't buying books. A purchasing agent angrily admonished her for recommending a lightweight box to save a few pennies. I'm just not buying boxes. I am trying to buy a damage-free delivery for the products we ship. The box you suggest will not give us the results we want. A sportswear sales rep called upon a small apparel dealer that had a serious overstock of outerwear. They were reducing its open-to-buy budget. The representative spent no time trying to sell the line, but rather spent hours trying to create a promotion that reduced the dealer's outerwear inventory to create a loyal customer. The sale has been defined as a solution of a problem. The buyer is not looking for a product or a service, but is rather seeking a solution to a problem. Salespeople who carry into the prospect a helpful idea are likely to carry out an order for the product. Chicago-based department store change Carson Peary Scott & Company tells the new salespeople, Serve when you sell. Put yourself in your customer's shoes and give the service that you expect to receive. Uh, the most important rule of superior salesmanship is always advise the customer for her own best interests. That's service selling, that's Carson selling. Of an outstanding salesman who sold to repeat customers, it was said, he didn't have any customers. He only had friends. To this man's customers, he never was a salesman. He was just a helpful friend. Service to the buyer may be big. Here are the plans and the specifications for that blasting job you have to do. He said the industrial sales rep to the contractor, working on the new state toll road through the hills, laying out the complete picture of the placements of the blasts, with full details of needed supplies. All costs were estimated. Service to the buyer may be small. You told me this morning that you were having trouble with that spring on your big machine phoned the saleswoman to a customer. As soon as I get back to the plant, I asked if our people could fix it, and they said it could be fixed with only a slight adjustment. If you'll have one of your people call him in the morning, he will be very glad to give the instructions on what to do. Big or small, the spirit of service was at work, making friends and winning sales. A word of caution. When offering to help or advice to a prospect, avoid assuming a patronizing air. Listen to the prospect's problem and avoid the attitude of a superior. You and your prospect must tackle the problem together and reach the solution together. The Modern Concept of Selling when you begin to grasp the true role of salesmanship in society, you no longer place much emphasis on overpowering personalities. 
blatant line of blank sales talk and a liberal use of high-pressure tactics in order to get the job done. Prospects have seen so many sales reps of this sort that they recognize the type, regardless of the nuances, and give them a short hearing, if any. With this elevation in the standards of selling has come an improved position of salespeople socially. Now they are regarded as a necessary and respectable part of the social and economic structure. The very term salesman or saleswoman is being redefined. The medicine man of the movies has given way to the pharmaceutical expert, equipped to brief the doc and the pharmacist on the virtues of the latest drugs. The life insurance agent has been replaced by the chartered life underwriter and the estate planner, while the furniture salesperson has become an interior designer. The former paper bag sales rep is now a packaging consultant. The sales rep is now regarded as the expert, persons professionally trained and competent to render highly valuable service. Even the ethics attitudes of salespeople is changing. It is not uncommon for a salesperson to advise the prospect against buying, even though a sale might easily be made. There is no better way to win the confidence of customers than proving that their interests are supreme. A truck sales rep told a prospect that they didn't need a truck, but that when his business reached a certain figure, he would be wise to invest in one. The prospect waited until his business grew to the volume specified by the salesman, and then asked him to prescribe the type of truck he needed. No competition was invited by the buyer because he had confidence in the rep. Now, there are some mythologies to selling, and all of us have dealt with salespeople. We've heard stories about them, and we've read stories about them. Many of us have even tried to sell something ourselves at some point in time in our lives. From all these experiences, we have garnered some perceptions of selling and what it's actually like. Most of these perceptions are just myths, and many people shun sellers because they believe the mythology that surrounds sales. Let's examine and debunk some of these myths. When we're through, you should have a better idea of what selling is all about. Myth 1. Salesmen are born, not made. The adage that salespeople are born and not made has caused untold damage because it leads the uninformed to believe that all a salesperson has to do is grab some firm sample kit and get out in the field. If one is truly a born seller, then success will quickly follow, and if one is not so endowed, it will quickly be found out. This is utter nonsense. Such people are usually doomed to failure before they even make the first call. Selling is a complicated art which can take years to master. As one cartoon says, Schmetley, I don't care what Robert Preston wore in Music Man. Either give that outfit back to the horse you stole it from, or go sell trombones. It is incredible to observe the ego of many would-be salespeople. The doctor, the lawyer, the CPA, the plumber, 
the construction man, and the trucker all realize they must spend years studying and practicing their trades before they can be considered proficient. Not the barn seller, not the superhero who can give the product a quick once-over and sell it right away. Of course, this attitude gets neophytes into trouble quickly. They learn the hard way that they must study and practice their art, just as other professionals must before they gain proficiency. The principles of salesmanship can be taught and learned, just as surely as those of agriculture, engineering, law, or medicine. As in those other occupations, the student may not be a skilled practitioner until a wholesome amount of practical experiments has been enjoyed. But the student will become skilled much more quickly by observing the principles and not attempting to learn entirely by trial and error, a method that is likely to be rather rough on both parties. The modern psychologist says that we are molded more and more by our environment than heredity. They insist that it is possible even to alter the personality by training. Some assert that proper environment and training can materially raise one's IQ. Anyone aspiring to a career in sales should be heartened by the news that nearly everything essential to selling success can be acquired, assuming more normal physical and mental faculties. The old saying that salesmen are born and not made is no more true of salesmen than of singers and artists or athletes. Perhaps not nearly so true. The individual of natural endowment can become a good salesperson if they are willing to put forth the required effort even if they could never hope to become a great athlete or a singer. Vincent Riego, former president of the American Tobacco Company and known as one of the country's finest salesmen, bluntly asserts, Salesmen are made, rarely are they born, and generally when the so-called born salesman gets into rough going, he fails. In replying to those die-hard souls who cling to their beliefs about the genetic foundations of selling, the best answer is found in the experience of hundreds of well-managed corporations, which have for many years trained or taught their salespeople by every device known to man. They have demonstrated over and over again that the trained salesperson can far outsell the untrained one. With such firms as IBM, Xerox, NCR, Armstrong Cork, and Sperry Rand maintain expensive sales training schools for their people, if they were not convinced that people can be taught how to sell, many of these concerns prefer to hire bright young people who have had no selling experience in the belief that they can more easily be taught to sell properly if they have not made their minds confused by some misguided salesperson of the old school. Johnson & Johnson increased the sales of its products and chain at independent drug stores by as much as 300% through training courses for retail salespeople. The get-rich-quick ads for sales jobs have given folks the wrong idea on selling. Many who have would otherwise made excellent salespeople have been shunted into the fields of endeavor because of unfortunate experience on the first sales jobs. 
without proper training, they were thrust into the field only to experience humiliation and failure, the likes of which they were not prepared. Myth 2. Salespeople are always good talk. Everyone knows that you have to be glib to sell. Right? Wrong. Good salespeople are good listeners. Selling is the art of asking the right questions. Questions that lead the prospect to think that your sales proposition will give them the upper hand. When the customer talks, you gain several advantages. You learn what the customer wants. You learn what the customer is thinking about. You learn what the customer is like. You have time to think about the sale and develop some ways of satisfying the prospect's desires. The customer feels that you were really trying to learn about his or her problems and respond to them with specific recommendations that will give them the upper hand. When the salesperson and you talk, only you feel great. The customer is apt to get bored. You are not learning much that will help you get the sales. So learn how to get the customer to talk with you. Think of it as an interrogation. If you're trying to learn who the customer is, where they live, and who they work for, are you going to tell them everything about you, where you're from, and who you work for? Learn how to get the customer to talk to you. Myth three. The good salesperson can sell anything. Wrong. There are all sorts of top-notch industrial grade salespeople who would do poorly in retail. Just because an individual is great at selling cars does not mean the same person would be able to sell steel with equal success. Great salespeople love the goods they're selling. Mike Schwartz, owner-manager of Nina Carlton, a fabric store in Dallas, Texas, relates how everyone in his family laughed at his father and his grandfather's devotion to their goods. They actually were saddened by selling some fine fabrics. It was like parting with an old friend. Mike had sold some of the world's finest cashmere fabrics in stock at $235 a yard, almost solely for his own enjoyment. Mike communicates his love for fabrics to his customers as he talks. The point is that you should find some goods about which you can develop some enthusiasm. If you don't like what you're selling, stop selling it and find something you do like. If you can't find anything you enjoy selling, then perhaps another profession would be advisable. Life is simply too short to spend it doing something you dislike. And if you have to go into sales, you'd do better if you sell something which you have confidence in and some interest. Myth 4. A good salesperson can sell to anyone. A good salesperson does not even try to sell to anyone. Good professional salespeople spend their time with good prospects. People are customers that need the products and can afford to pay for them. The salesperson who insists on trying to twist arms of some poor person who neither needs or wants the goods is not a good salesperson. 
only a confidence artist. Myth 5. Selling is one long life of fun and games. Traveling, whining, and dining. The folklore and tales perpetuated from the myth of the traveling salesman who is continually on the road, fitting from one tryst to another, partying every night. Well, some sales purple must travel, many do not. Industrial selling is largely concentrated in the large urban centers. The amount of traveling by the average industrial salesperson is modest. And as for the jokes, you should know better than that. However, entertainment is required for some selling jobs. Unquestionably, entertaining prospects and customers is good business. But several factors limit the amount of entertaining most salespeople can do. First, because of the absurdly high costs of entertaining, companies are doing far less today than previous. Second, in the era of bribery and buyer-seller relationships, they get carefully scrutinized, and many sellers are being far more discreet. Moreover, many buyers discourage the salespeople who call upon them from offering entertainment. Third, the tax regulations, tax regulations, tax regulations have a significant impact on entertainment practices. The income tax people dislike the fact that taxpayers have been overly extravagant in entertaining some customers. Tax agents have been carefully auditing the expense accounts and examining entertainment expenditures to determine the purpose of the entertainment, where it took place, who was being entertained, and how they were being entertained, as long as the amount spent. The days of unaudited expense accounts are over. There's one other important factor. Most salespeople who must do a lot of entertaining report that it gets to be a burden fast. Spending night after night out on the town may seem like a good time to you, but you don't have to do it. Even entertaining can sometimes be hazardous to your health. Myth 6. The good salesperson never takes no for an answer. There isn't a salesperson alive who makes a sale every time. People will turn your proposition down. And rightfully so if it's wrong for them. At other times, people who look like prospective clients for your goods really won't be. Don't feel you have failed when someone refuses to buy your wares. But any good rapist knows, no is no. Myth 7. The Locker Room Syndrome. Many people think that the successful industrial salesman does most of his business on the golf course, at ball games, or around the poker table. The image of the hard-drinking, drug-using, sports-loving, card-playing, Male chauvinist has permeated the sales world for years, and unfortunately, it is largely nonsense. Many women sell industrial goods by simply calling on the right people in prospective companies and selling the goods on their own merits. Now, isn't that a quaint way to do business? Moreover, men do the same thing. Call on people in their offices and sell their wares on the basis of what they will do for the customer. Myth 8. Selling is a bag of tricks. True, 
there are some sales techniques. After all, that's what this video is all about. But success is not merely a matter of mastering them. Take any one sales technique we will not cover in the video. Some will be able to use it successfully. Others will not. The technique does not determine success. You do. You will learn what works for you and what doesn't. It's called experience. Myth 9. People don't want to buy. Many sales managers are guilty of planting the idea in the heads of their salespeople that people don't want to buy. Therefore, you as the salesperson must beat them over the head to make a sale. What nonsense. The vast bulk of goods and services are bought, not sold. There are all sorts of people and firms out there who need all sorts of things and are waving money around just to buy them. To a large extent, your job is to locate those people and sell them on what they want. Let's face it, if people didn't want to buy, most of the people who are passing themselves off would starve to death. They aren't selling the wares because of their selling talents, but rather because the market wants what they're selling. Myth 10. The get-rich-quick illusion. Some people may make a lot of money quickly in selling, and some people win a lot of money in Vegas, but it doesn't pay to bet that way. More often, money will come to you after you learn the trade and the territory. Don't expect to be an immediate success in sales. If you are, that's to your credit. But if you're not, don't be discouraged. Give yourself time to develop the selling skills and work habits. Before we go, I will leave you some selling questions to comment in the comment box below. And don't forget to subscribe. These 10 questions should help you become a better salesperson. Question number one. In what situations are the company's top executives called upon to sell? Question two. Why is getting along with people essentially a matter of salesmanship? Question three. What do you expect of salespeople with whom you do business? Question 4. Why would bankers need to learn how to sell? Question 5. Why does the entrepreneur especially have to be adept at selling? Question 6. Why must Procter & Gamble back up its huge advertising campaigns with a sales force of more than 8,000 people? Question 7. Why is listening the central talent of the professional salesperson? Question 8. What products or services do you think you could best sell? Question 9. What products or services are you reluctant to sell? Question 10. Think back over the past week. In what situations do you need persuasive skills? I will see you in the next video of self. Uh.